Hello, my name is Brian Ziegler, and I am the compounding pharmacist at Moss Compounding Pharmacy in Florence, South Carolina. Thank you for the opportunity to share with you a, a little bit about unique dosage forms that can be compounded. And in this presentation, um, my goal is, is to give you a, just a general overview and plant some ideas about the value that a compounding pharmacy can bring to your practice. So as I mentioned, um, I am with Moss Compounding Pharmacy and I serve as the president and clinical compounding pharmacist there. In addition, I have a clinical adjunct associate uh, professor appointment at the University of South Carolina College of Pharmacy. Um, our practice, just to give you a little background so that you know what perspective that I'm presenting from, we are a full-scale compounding pharmacy. That means that our specialty is compounding, um, and we focus on human and veterinary compounding. Uh, we do prepare sterile and non-sterile preparations, and we also do hazardous compounding, but only for non-sterile compounds. I wish to start out the presentation by talking about why use a compounding pharmacy. And I know there's some other presentations around compounding, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but I think it lays the foundation for the rest of my presentation. And I want to get a few points out. One is, is it opens the door to a wide array of dosage form options. Most practitioners are not even aware of all the different options. And we're going to hopefully plant some, some ideas with this presentation, but to make some points here. So delivering drugs in different manners than are commercially available. So for example, you know, drug that might only be available orally. Well, what if we could do that topically? Or what if we could do it vaginally or rectally? That's compounding, you know, come into play in many cases. If we got patients with allergies, well, could we make that product without dyes or inactive ingredients that that patient has an allergy to? Yeah, we, we potentially could, and that's one of the, the key services we provide. Um, are there uh, dosing options that might not be available? So, you know, you think about, for example, the pediatric population. You know, there might be a few options that are manufactured or commercially available for a particular drug, only available in adult doses, and, and we need a pediatric dose, and, um, and, and we can make that. Other options, you know, we, we think about this term of, uh, personalized medicine and, and creating this customized approach to medicine therapy. And, and I chuckle when I hear that because I know what that context means today. In most cases, it's pharmacogenomics and, and this genomic testing to determine what therapy a patient would respond to. But I also think about it from a compounding perspective. And we were the original, you know, personalized medicine um, providers because everything we make is customized for a specific patient. It's just one size does not fit all approach. And, and the last thing to throw in here is, you know, compounding provides a great option when there's drug shortages, which we seem to always have. And then when products have been discontinued by manufacturers, we may still be able to make it. So I'm going to break up the rest of the discussion really into a couple of different categories. So we're going to look at things from a non-sterile dosage form standpoint. And within that, I'm going to break it down into oral, topical, vaginal, and rectal preparation ideas. And then we're going to look briefly at sterile dosage forms that can commonly be compounded. And those are going to include injectables, ophthalmic, and nebulization products. And on the right, you'll notice that I've also got a couple of different uh, boxes here. I've got non-hazardous versus hazardous. And in many cases in the pharmacy world, in the compounding space, this is also how we differentiate what we can and cannot do. So there's a lot of regulation around compounding pharmacy and um, hazardous as well as sterile and non-sterile preparations and all these different um, processes and regulatory components that we have to meet impact what we may or may not be able to do. Okay, we're going to start out talking about oral dosage forms. Before I dive into that, a couple of quick things. One, I'm going to focus really on the dosage forms just to give you an idea of all the different things that can be made by a compounding pharmacy, not necessarily going into specific formulations. There are 
thousands of formulations that at our pharmacy, for example, we have in our database that we routinely use. So we have lots of options for these things. Um, and we come up with new ones on a daily basis. So um, it's, a, it's a growing list. Uh, the other thing is um, there are varying levels of what pharmacies may be capable of making based on um, their, their training, their expertise, as well as their investment in some equipment to be able to make some of these dosage forms. So uh, on this screen, for example, you'll notice I got a couple of things that are uh, starred here, and you'll notice at the bottom there's a note that says required specialized equipment. You know, I typically think of pharmacies in the compounding space that, you know, you've got your entry level pharmacies and they've got your basic equipment. So they've got mortars and pestles, ointment slabs, some scales to measure out ingredients and some beakers maybe to mix some liquids and and that might be their 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 equipment and they're going to be very limited on what they can make they can make you know some liquids some um, topicals uh, maybe some powder options um, but that may be the extent of what they can do and it's all going to be made by hand they might be able to make some trochies etc some lollipops but they're going to be real limited beyond that those that then take that next step forward and that next investment level, they're going to have some additional equipment. They're going to be able to make some of these different dosage forms like capsules and tablets, sublingual tablets, RDTs. You know, they've got that tablet press. They've got the capsule making machine. They've got the different molds and then some sort of a heat source to be able to make these things harden. Those are all going to be advanced level training and advanced level equipment investment. So that's going to be what differentiates some of the different types of practices out there. So with that said, we're going to dive in and look at some of the, the common dosage forms in the oral space. Capsules, very popular. Um, the typical capsules are powder filled and we can have immediate release type capsules. Uh, we can also have um, uh, sustained release or timed released options. Those typically have a cellulose-based ingredient that when it gets wet, it's going to gel, it's going to clump with the active ingredient inside of it, and it's going to slowly dissolve and release the active ingredient. Um, you know, we've got different types of capsules. So you've got gelatin capsules, you've got cellulose or vegetable type capsules, you've got all different types of colors. So if you've got folks with dye allergies, etc., all of those variables can be taken into consideration. Uh, there are some capsules that are enteric coated uh, on the outside, so that way if we needed to basically protect the active ingredient with some enteric coating so it dissolves in a certain way, um, you know, that's, that's an option as well. Um, tablets, um, oh, and going back to capsules, there's also some oil-filled capsules. Some drugs may be more stable that way where you can fill capsules with oil. Um, you know, it, very time consuming process to do that, but it is an option. Um, tablets, uh, this is an advanced level option. Many pharmacies may not be able to do tablets. They require a pretty substantial investment in a tablet press and not only in the equipment, but also the time to master um, the formulation for an individual tablet. Um, and so that's something that a lot of pharmacies can't make. They typically make capsules as an alternative, which is usually very, very viable. Um, but, you know, some pharmacies can do tablets. Now, sublingual tablets, a little bit different. This requires a mold and a heat source, and more pharmacies can do sublingual tablets. Sublingual tablets, though, the molds are usually pretty small, so you're pretty limited on what you can put in there as far as the amount of drug. Uh, but they're intended to dissolve quickly in the mouth. Uh, they do take some time to make because you have to heat them over an extended period of time for them to harden properly. And, um, and, and the you know, typical uses on that may be like low dose hormones for female patients. In all honesty, sublingual tablets have been pretty much replaced with rapid dissolve tablets and trochies, the next two items in the list. Uh, so rapid dissolve tablets, these are ones that quickly dissolve in the mouth, a little bit larger so you can put more drug in those. Um, there's commercially available options like Zofran and some of your mental health medications. We can compound a wide array of, of options in an RDT. Uh, trochies. So trochies, a um, couple of different options. These are like lozenges. If you've never seen a trochee, this is a trochee mold right here on the bottom right in the blue. 
Um, they are uh, square in shape in most cases. Um, they are give you a little bit more room to add more drug than a sublingual tablet. They are going to dissolve in the mouth, so they're intended for buccal sublingual type of dosing. Um, they're going to typically take you know somewhere between five and ten minutes on average to dissolve. And there's different base options that you could choose. So gelatin is probably our most common one now, and polyethylene glycol is is the older original version. Gelatin is much more soft and pliable. You can easily split it if you need to cut it in quarters or halves. Um, and it's easier to flavor it, in my opinion. Lots of options for flavoring, so patient preference can come into play here. Polyglycol, there are lots of flavoring options, but they're more hard and waxy in nature, a little more uncomfortable to try and put these under the tongue. So uh, this would be you know, something usually tucked on the side cheek. They take a little longer to dissolve and um, just kind of a funky taste to them and, and some, some patients you know, say that. Taste is very subjective though. Um, the last option I hear is a, is a brand, branded option that's made by one of our suppliers called Natatroki. It's a, it's a pretty novel base uh, option that's come out recently. It has the consistency of white chocolate and it feels like chocolate melting in your mouth. And so um, that's a pretty unique one and it's got a natural sweetener in it. So for those patients that are really focused on, um, you know, trying to avoid uh, synthetic ingredients and so forth, that's, a, that's an option we use for those patients. Lollipops, another oral dosage form. There's some pictures of lollipops there. Uh, typically anesthetic type medications are most commonly used with those. Our three main liquids are here in the center. So we got suspensions, syrups, and solutions. Um, suspensions are typically made out of aqueous options or oil-based options. Um, the oil options are typically olive oil, um, almond oil, or MCT oil. And um, the preference between them typically revolves around stability of the drug, whether we're doing aqueous or oil. Um, allergy information. Um, the other thing might be the, um, uh, the shelf life. Oil-based options are going to typically have longer shelf lives than aqueous options. Um, and other things like the population that we're treating, so autistic kids and, and doing suspensions um, in, in liquids, you know, the texture and the flavoring all matter whether or not that child is going to be acceptable of taking that medication. Um, last couple of options here, we got oral sprays, gels, and pastes. Um, once again, just unique options that we can do in the mouth. Okay, so now we're going to shift gears and talk about topical dosage forms, and there's lots of topical options. So we have creams, um, and creams can be used in a variety of different um, body areas. Um, and I will say with the topical dosage forms, I'm going to provide a second presentation and we're going to dive into bases for topicals. So I'm going to spend way more time in that presentation going more into depth with topical preparation. So I'll be very light in the discussion here. Um, gels are something that are another option. Uh, they're, they're typically either water-based, so they would be a hydrogel, um, or they could be alcohol-based. Those are two most common types, but there's other things that you could possibly make a gel out of, but those are the most common ones. Alcohol-based gels can be very drying, um, and sometimes we want that. Um, other times we don't. Um, most common hydrogel that we use is with male testosterone replacement. Um, most of your commercially available testosterone gel gels for males are alcohol-based. They, you know, pretty large volume. They can be drying on the skin, especially when you're applying every day. And in the winter time, they can be really bad when the humidity level is so low and people's skin dries anyway. So hydrogels provide great alternatives for patients and we get good absorption, um, less drying effect on the skin. Transdermal preparations, also known as permeation enhanced gels. Uh, these are very popular uh, when we're trying to drive drug through the stratum cordium and get it deeper into the epidermis and dermis, and in some cases, even get it into the systemic circulation through a topical application. Uh, these are very popular options. So um, ideas of, of how we use this, um, very common one would be, um, you know, trying to get it into systemic circulation. We apply things on the wrist for patients in hospice. So um, ABH gel, for those of you that have done hospice care, that's Ativan, Benadryl, and Haldol. 
um, anti-nausea, calming effect, sedative effect uh, with those, and you don't have to go orally with those medications. Uh, we can treat nausea the same way with promethazine. Place it on the wrist, rub it in with the other wrist. You can concentrate it down very low and you dose it very similar to oral medications and it works very well. So those are options where we're going through very thin skin, we got really good blood supply, very close to the surface of the skin, and we can drive the drug directly into the systemic circulation. Other uses of transdermals are typically around pain management, neuropathy, and so forth. We're just trying to get it into the epidermis and dermis in many of those cases with a variety of different drugs. Ointments, um, lots of uses with ointments. Um, we have, uh, most of these are all made with, you know, hydrocarbon uh, type ingredients. So your most common one would be uh, petrolatum, which is your most common ointment that you have as a base. And that's typically things like Vaseline would be a petrolatum base. Uh, but it includes other things like lanolin and so forth. Ointments um, are something that you typically would include maybe some antibiotics, maybe some steroids, um, those are common ingredients and in ointments. We want those drugs to basically um, have a lot of uh, contact with the skin for an extended period of time. Ointments have this occlusive type of a nature to it, trap those drugs up against the surface of the skin. We get a little bit better um, absorption and um, contact time than we would with a cream. So uh, that's the advantage that ointments typically have over creams, but they are messy. They are greasy. Certain body areas, it's just not feasible to use an ointment. Lotions. Lotions are a lot like creams. They're just more water content to them. Uh, they're a little more runny, but pretty much same types of drugs we'd put in creams, we could put in lotions. Most common things are usually anti-itch um, and moisturizing type ingredients that we would use for dry skin very commonly. Shampoos. We can compound shampoos. So uh, any types of issues on the scalp, um, you can create medicated shampoos for patients. Foams, um, I've got these asterisk here. Foams would require um, a specialized device in order to create that foam mechanism, but foams can be great options not only for the scalp as treatments for things like alopecia and other types of medicated options on the scalp, but you can also use it for like facial cleansers and other cleansers for the rest of the body in a foam format. Topical solutions, uh, many times these are things that are applied like areas such as the folds of the skin or maybe the scalp um, is typically where you'd use a topical solution. And common ingredients in those might be things like steroids, um, antifungals, antibiotics. Um, those are some common options to include in topical solutions. Many of those are typically made of, you know, either an aqueous base or an alcohol base, or maybe a propylene glycol base. Um, ear drops, ear powders, those are common options um, that we do compound. We make deodorant and antiperspirants. Lip balms, uh, sprays, both topical sprays for the skin and the scalp, um, but, and also the mouth, and we talked about those as well, but also nasal sprays are an option. And nasal sprays are a non-sterile drug dosage form. Um, that's a lot of confusion among some providers as to whether or not nasal sprays need to be sterile. They can be non-sterile. However, if it is something that is inhaled into the lungs, so a, a nebulization delivery, that has to be sterile. So if it's just a nasal spray, non-sterile, if it's going into the lungs, it needs to be sterile. Now you'll notice what's not on the list here, transdermal patches. Transdermal patches have a lot of advanced technology and not something that can be comp compounded at this time. Okay, vaginal dosage forms. This is another one where there's a lot of creativity, a lot of unique options that a lot of practitioners are unfamiliar with. Um, creams, certainly lots of options with creams. Probably some of the more common ones that we use are hormone replacement vaginal creams, estrogen-based options, for example, vitamin E, is a common additive or a standalone for vaginal cream for moisturization. So lots of different options here. Antibiotics, um, antifungal medications, et cetera, can be all used in these creams. Ointments, um, there's you know, petrolatum-based options if we need it. 
um, but also there's some just anhydrous um, dosage forms that uh, can be very mucoadhesive and those are fantastic because um, both in the gels and in the ointments you'll notice I have this mucoadhesive option what that means is that it adheres really well to the mucosal tissue so you think vaginal you think rectal even the nasal mucosa and the oral mucosa tissue all very similar and this mucoadhesive property allows the drug to adhere to the tissue longer we get better effects because of that longer adhesion and uh, we can dose the drug sometimes less frequently so options with ointments and gels we do a lot of things with you know pain management um, steroids for example um, you know pain management options may be neuropathic pain could be other types of pain so we might have a combination of local anesthetics or you know neuropathic medications particularly when we're dealing with conditions like vulvodynia or um, pelvic floor pain or pelvic floor pain or endometriosis pain etc those are some common uses there suppositories um, we make a lot of suppositories everything from hormone type suppositories to um, you know boric acid and other antibacterial antifungal options there's a number of different bases that you can make suppositories out of and so most common is like a fatty acid base um, but you can also do things like cocoa butter a little harder to work with melts a little faster but in some cases you know a patient may need cocoa butter as an option um, and then also there's a polyethylene glycol base and the difference between these is typically around you know sometimes it's the melting point of the suppository but also the nature of the drug if you know the chemistry of those individual ingredients and the different bases may influence how quickly those drugs are released from the suppository and that would impact onset rapid dissolve tablets so we talked about them in the oral dosage form they too can be used vaginally um, it's a pretty unique way to use those um, they will dissolve when they get wet and so therefore it can release the drugs quickly into the vaginal cavity I've got a picture here you know packaging of these compounds is another important aspect of, of what makes compounds unique uh, so not only do we have to make it but then we got to think about how's the patient going to store it so stability of the drug and also how are they going to measure out that dose accurately so there's a lot of thought that goes into all of this process that that we work on on a daily basis this little picture here that's on the right hand side of the screen is a picture of a dosing device called a toffee click pearl love these things we use them a lot with vaginal dosage forms uh, you can see that it's got a bottom dial here this is a lot like a deodorant you dial the bottom it pushes a plunger up through the center and it pushes out a meter dose amount of cream there's a little mouth rim here that this vaginal applicator tip would actually snap right here and the cream would be pushed up into the applicator and then the patient would just remove the applicator and use their vaginal dose so those are fantastic rectal um, these are some of the more interesting ones particularly when we get to counsel patients uh, once again we talked about gels um, muco adhesive rectal gels are pretty pretty amazing with what they can do for patients they can be real game changers um, you think external hemorrhoids and how quickly we could uh, heal those up but also some internal uses with this mucoadhesive nature of some of these um, these different compounded options suppositories we talked about those you know have the same type of bases that we do vaginally um, on the right hand side here I've got a picture of one of our more unique doses worms this is a rectal rocket in case you've never seen a rectal rocket this is a specially shaped suppository uh, a typical suppository has this bullet point tip here but this thing here has got a, a neck and then this wide flange on the base and these things make make people's eyes bulge when they see them for the first time but they are a real effective dosage form the medication is throughout the entire thing um, and when these are inserted this part right here the pointed tip and the neck are internal the neck is right at the rectum and then this part is flush up against the, the, the rectum but it's external and then this piece is all external so these are intended for uh, hemorrhoids that are internal right here and external you can treat them both at the same time so you know the shape of the suppository and the mold 
is part of the problem solving process and then choosing the right medications to put in here is the other piece of the puzzle. Uh, these are very effective. Um, usually, you know, knock out hemorrhoids in a couple of days um, versus a couple of weeks. Um, other dosage forms, enemas, ointments. Ointments are great for things like rectal fissures um, and other tears. We use those a lot. And then, of course, we have cream options as well for rectal use. Okay, sterile. And very quickly, just because we're running out of time, uh, there's injectables. Typically, most compounding pharmacies can do aqueous solutions and a few oil-based solutions. Suspensions, these are quite difficult to compound because a suspension by definition is, is we're suspending the drug um, for a short period of time and as it sets, then the drug will settle back in the bottom of the solution. You shake it or agitate it and then it basically resuspends the drug. The challenge is, is can you properly mix and then package the suspension and sterilize it all during that short time period before the suspension starts to separate. And if it separates before you can accomplish that, you run the risk if you're making multiple you know, syringes or, or vials that one has more active drug in it than the other. So that's why those are very difficult to make. Some pharmacies just don't have the ability to do them. Ophthalmic preparations, once again, mostly focused on solutions for the eye drops. Um, there are some suspension options out there, but same type of difficulty here as we see with the injectables. Ointments, those are an option that some pharmacies can compound. The sterilization process with ointments is a little bit more involved, so a lot of pharmacies may not be able to do ointments, but they could do drops. And then nebulization, once again, solutions is the most common way if a pharmacy can do those. Uh, the challenge with this is, is how to sterilize the containers in addition to sterilizing the product. So a lot of pharmacies may not be able to do nebulization either. All right, lastly, as I wrap up, so real quickly, um, when you're trying to find a, a compounding pharmacy partner, just keep in mind that not all compounding pharmacies are created equal. Some may be big, some may be small, some may have certain specialties, um, others just may do the very basics. And so, you know, when you're trying to figure out what's the capability of your compounding pharmacy partner, there's a handful of questions that you may wanna ask. So what's the scope of the compounding facility? What's their capability? You can ask that. Uh, what's the level of staff training and expertise? So what, what do they consider their expertise and how much training do they have? types of equipment do they have so that, you know, types of dosage forms that they could make. Does the pharmacy have adequate equipment to make high quality preparations? You know, facilities like ours, we've made lots of investment in this equipment, whereas there's other compounding pharmacies that have not. We have more capability because of that, and we produce a very high quality product that's very reproducible because of that equipment. Does the pharmacy ensure their quality of their preparation? So what level of quality testing, both in-house and external? Uh, what types of technology do they have for you know, their record keeping and their specifications for um, percent error with their preparations? Um, what, what are they doing there? And also with their ingredients, this makes a big difference. What's the quality of the ingredients? I personally, you know, I spend more money than some of my peers on ingredients but I buy the best quality that I can get. And I, it does cost more, but you get what you pay for. And the quality of the preparations we make does differ when the quality is inferior. And so that is one area I just choose not to compromise. And I explain that to my practitioners, my patients, that you know this is, this is why mine might be a little bit more expensive. Is the compounding pharmacy a valuable educational resource for prescribers? That's something we take pride in. A lot of pharmacies do, but not all of them do this. Um, you know, that's one of the things that when most practitioners call me for phoning in a prescription, I'd say 50% of the time when I get prescriptions phoned into my clinic or into my pharmacy, the practitioners at the clinic have no idea what they're calling in. They don't know what they want to order yet. The conversation starts off here's my situation, here's what we've tried, nothing's worked, what have you got? 
And that's where we then help fill in the gap. We educate and say, well, here's our options. Here's what we could make. Here's what the literature says. Here's how effective this has been. Here's what the cost is. All of that education is part of the service. And so that, along with other things like these types of programs, educational services, really help practitioners. Does the pharmacist provide education to the patients? This is vital. Um, most of these dosage forms require some education so that there's proper use and, 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 and in turn you get better outcomes. Okay, well that's everything I wanted to share. Um, if you have questions, certainly if there's specific formulations you're looking for, kind of want to know more details about certain formulations, let me know. Uh, we certainly have got all kinds of materials that we could share there with you. This is my contact information, my email, and I uh, look forward to hearing from some of you. Thank you so much for listening.